first and foremost, welcome everybody to another episode of Disruptors in the Culture. It is myself, Joshua Meekins, along with Amira Smith. And we have a special guest today who is one of my longtime friends. We have Dominique Bandu. Um, I'm going to let Dominique introduce herself and what she does. Ooh, okay, so very quick, brief synopsis of myself. Um, my name is Dominique, but you can call me Dom. Everybody calls me Dom. Um, I'm originally from the New York CT area. Um, and uh, I mean, before I get into what I do from a career standpoint, um, one of the things Josh asked me, like, who are you? And I'm like, um, a human. Um, and that's real. Like how I just describe myself is just kind of like a person, a black woman of color, um, a sister, a daughter, and a creative. Um, I'm a hard E. I'm an extroverted person. Um, I'm a Gemini. Um, and I'm pretty hardcore textbook June Gemini. Um, and I'm also a technical designer. So in my professional life, um, I've been working at Under Armour in the Baltimore area for about almost eight years, about seven and a half years. Um, and I specifically work on um, men's apparel, pinnacle fleece, um, project rock, underwear. I also work on youth products and um, trying to think an outlet. So pretty much run the gamut of things that I work on most recently. Um, and it's a lot of fun. Making clothing is a lot of fun. So that's kind of myself in a nutshell. Oh. Um, so what does it mean to be a technical designer at Under Armour? Like what exactly, how is that different than maybe like a fashion designer under the label? Right, so I'm glad you asked because I'm pretty sure nobody knows what that even means. Like my own, yeah. friend, what is that? Um, I don't even know if my family knows what it means to be honest. So essentially in the industry, um, my role can kind of it falls under a couple of different names. It can either be a technical designer, it can be a technical developer, it can be an apparel developer, um, kind of ranges. And so essentially the difference um, between a technical designer and a creative designer is that the creative designer essentially uh, comes up with the design ethos and um, you know concept, inspiration, um, aesthetic for the overarching line and they will actually design what that imagery will look like. Um, they will sketch it out and then we essentially will work together um, to communicate that to me and then I will actually develop it into a three-dimensional garment. Um, I'm the liaison between the factory so I do a lot of vendor communication but I also get the samples so I'm the first person that touches all the samples and I fit it on a live model. I do all the pattern corrections um, and as the industry is evolving I do a lot of virtual prototyping um, so a lot of playing in different 3D softwares and programs to actually um, visualize a sample or, you know, get a sample to be at a place that's good enough to get to a consumer without actually having to physically touch it, especially like during these times in COVID. So that's pretty much the difference between the two, but it's really a marriage, right? Like one's, one um, is designing and the other one is producing, but you can't have one without the other. And you can really tell how great a garment is or a style or a product is based on the technical designer and like how much of a hand they have in it. Um, so yeah, we're, we're pretty important, but we're kind of the unsung heroes of the design process. That's crazy because we hear about fashion design and we usually just think, oh, lead designer. We don't think that, um, that there would be two, one person. Cause I, but it makes sense as far as in like with, even most businesses, you have the person who has like the creative vision for it. And then the other person has to like bring it to life. They're like, okay, this is how we can realistically make this happen. Yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> so, so how um, did you always see yourself? Like what inspired you to enter the industry and take that path specifically to be a technical designer versus like, you know, like a creative fashion designer? Yeah. So, I mean, it's funny, like, Based on my trajectory, I've always been into into art. I've always been creative. Um, I went to private school for like eight years and that's some very traditional way of like, you go to school, you study, you go to a good college, you know, and you will probably study a traditional discipline of some sort. Um, but very early on, I was just always like dressing up in my grandmother's scarves. Um, I grew up spending a lot of time um, being raised by my grandparents. Um, and so, 
I'd just be in her room for hours, like making different things, making dresses, being into stuff. Um, and I was very blessed to have a mom who like, if you told her like, I wanna be a professional dog walker, like you get signed up for a dog walking class, you know? So that was what kind of happened with me in art. Um, I was like, yeah, I wanna draw. And she was like, bet. Um, you've been signed up at Parsons. Um, you're going to Parsons for the pre-college academy. Mind you, I was like 12, no, I think I was like 13 or 14 to be fair. Um, Cause that was when I was old enough to take the subway by myself. And I remember getting in the class and there was like, everybody was like 17, 18. And I was like, did this lady like forge my age? Like what happened? <laughs> you know? but, um, yeah, I think having parents from the inner city and like them knowing how competitive like just certain, in, like certain areas are, um, she was just always like, if you're interested in it, I want to give you that opportunity I didn't have. So very, at a very young age, I was um, being in like all the different types of drawing schools. And I think it was her way of really testing how serious I was about it before she like put me in college for it. Because I think back then, like what, 10 years ago, like telling somebody that she wanted to go to school for design was like, okay, girl, like, sure, yeah. Um, but I was very blessed to have parents um, and family to support anything creatively I wanted to do, whether it being like painting all my walls, different murals myself, and then, you know, scrubbing it off and then doing something else like we're going to design classes. Like I got to do that very early on and I kind of was pretty, was pretty apparent that I was into that. Um, and so from there, if I'm really honest, I've never really admitted this. When I was at private school, I just didn't think I was like, smart enough to go to school to like be a tra do a traditional role looking back that's like the silliest thing I could have ever thought but um I felt like I could hide behind my work um I can be very shy at times um and so it was like well if I do this really dope painting you know I don't really have to present the painting you can just go and interpret what you what you feel when you look at the painting right um, and so that's kind of how I got into that. And then from there, I was just like, I love fashion. So it evolved um, into, you know, wanting to go to school for fashion and figuring out how to study um, that discipline in and of itself. You, um, so you're from New York and what's your, what would you, how do you identify as far as like ethnic background? Oh man, you just opened a can of worms. Um, so um, I have a really mixed background, but I would, I think the easiest way to, to, let me try and start this over, but essentially like I'm Caribbean, like I have a, I'd say like Indo-Caribbean. So on my mom's side, her mother is Chinese and black from Trinidad. Um, her father is um, from Louisiana. Um, and then on my dad's side, his mother is black from Jamaica and his father's Indian. Um, so a lot of that plays into it too, right? Like I have a lot of cultural mixing going on. And I think that like, to be quite honest, like in New York, that's like so basic, like there's mad yeah. mixing, right? But um, that's what was just like a part of my upbringing. So different foods, different cultures, different types of music. Um, and yeah, that's essentially, I, didn't, I identify as being just like a black person, um, but definitely with, you know, heritage, like Indian heritage and Caribbean heritage, for sure. Um, that makes me wonder, cause that's why I saw Josh had on, you know, one of the questions is like, how you identify as a black woman? And I'm like, or like as a black woman in the design industry. And I'm all like, well, let me ask the question. Does she, you know, sometimes we like yeah. we'll throw a label on someone um, and hearing, and I'm looking at you and I'm like, hmm, I think, you know, maybe there might be other influences. Cause so like, if your grandparents were immigrants, mm -hmm. um, that may also be a part of the, one of the reasons why your parents took it really seriously. Cause your parents are both from New York as well, right? Correct. Yes. So my mother's from, um, East Elmhurst and Flushing Queens. I have to rep them. Um, my dad's from Westchester. Um, and my grandparents first immigrated to the States, um, in Brooklyn by way of Brooklyn. So kind of where like the home front is um yeah so it is very serious you know and it's funny because like as I'm getting older I've been asking my uh family members like yo like what was your immigration story like how'd you get here like how did we even get here 
You know what I'm saying? I think we take it for granted now because we don't really have to think about the sacrifices. Like I was just asking my grandmother on my mother's side and she said, um, it was Christmas day and her mother said, get dressed. And she took us to the airport and that was it. Like, and she was 15. Wow. You know? Like, but my grandmother's one of nine and it was like, we, you need to get, go and have better for yourself. So she sent some to England. She sent some to, you know, the States. She sent some to Canada and we went with a family member and that family member raised her. So my aunt Chin, my auntie Chin, um, raised my grandmother in Brooklyn for many, many years. Um, and so she got married and had her own kids. Um, and so it's just very interesting how, uh, you know, it's very humbling. And, and that alone gives you the strength sometimes to get through some really trying experiences. Cause it's like, yo, if my family could do that, um, leave everything behind, not have much support and make something out of themselves. Like I have to take this seriously. Um, yeah. That's how I was wondering, like one of my best friends, she's Eritrean and they left during a civil war, like in her, um, <laughs> she was a really little baby, but her parents, anytime she would be like acting out of pocket, not take a school seriously or anything, even as a, she's 40 plus, they'll still say it. She'll be like, I walked for two days to get out of Eritrea to bring you to this country to have a better life. I had to wait to walk for days and days and or two, because she was on her back. So I had to title my back offer you to act crazy <laughs> right right so, it's, so, it's so true it's so true so that's a that's a great legacy to end up leaving behind just because like you know me and josh are grown and i'm pretty sure josh didn't you know hear about a technical designer in fashion because i honestly thought when i was like oh technical designer i assumed it would be like um you're kind of like product testing it for sports since it's under armor or mm -hmm something of that nature but then when you're just like it's it's really as simple as figuring out you know the best most efficient way for construction for it to and mm -hmm. it be sustainable and I'm just like wow I've read fashion magazines all my life but I've never even heard of that right? right so the awareness that you'll be able to create um having cre like put together a cohort of uh your colleagues who are doing it in, in different com companies there's definitely going to be other young black kids who will look and be like, oh, that's a career path for me. You know, yeah. looks like you said, if you don't see yourself, you don't, sometimes you don't even believe it can happen, but then it's like, that's kind of that unsung job position. Mm -hmm, for sure. And I think too, like, that's why prior to COVID, like when my organization has had opportunities to do mentorship within the Baltimore area, um, I make sure I go <laughs> and I tell them what I'm doing because, you know, to your point, you didn't know that there's somebody that draws the constructional technical views of how to make something or that gives down to the stitch length of how many stitches per inch or how wide or all of this information that I put in to the sketch, right? Because we have an international language, if you will, as it pertains to constructing a garment that every factory adheres by, whether it's in Asia or you know Latin America or even stateside. So um, letting kids know that if you like to make stuff, if you like to be hands-on and very tactile, like this is a great opportunity. Um, that's one of the first questions they ask you when you interview for a role like that. Like why not creative design? Because there is, um, there is a lot of misinformation around what tech even is. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, you're gonna be the product engineer. So like, do you like to do math? Cause you're gonna have to do a lot of fractions, you know, like, do you like to revise patterns? Do you like to really get in there with the nitty gritty and be hands on? Or, you know, do you wanna do more gestural drawings? Um, do you wanna focus on design inspiration? And like some days I'm like, yo, what did I get myself into? But then other days I'm just like, this was the most amazing thing. Because if you like to problem solve, like finding that unlock, on how to make something, right? That's knowledge that no one can ever take away from you. Like I always tell people, a technical designer is like fine wine, because you just get better with time. Like every time you learn how to make something, you put that in your toolkit, honey. You just like, mm, okay, how to do a jacket, got it. Woven or knit, got it. A bomber, got it. You know, a short, you know, so all of these experiences are accumulative in this role. But I think that there needs to be more visibility to our community so that kids can even feel like, oh, I could do that. Like, that's really dope. Um, there's just not enough conversation going on about it. A whole lot. Wow. I mean, as a whole, 
it's crazy to know that one representation does matter as you touched on um it's and it's also good to know that even they have opportunities within it that you can actually go back into the community and talk about the things that you do um i don't think you really see too many organizations allowing you know their staff to kind of outreach i know under armor is rooted in baltimore mm -hmm. so the fact that they have the ability to kind of go out into those communities and talk to those people um, about you know how do you get more involved or, or giving back in that way is, is absolutely kind of amazing yeah um, it's actually like we are required like 30 i think 30 plus hours each year yeah to of community service in the city of baltimore um, that's crazy so, that's it's good yeah it's good because you know what it's like i get to be with my people because mm -hmm. this is very much i think it's like 60 percent black in this in this city like it's sad sometimes but it's also so rewarding especially when you're dealing with children because you know that you can make a difference you know that well, it all it takes is one conversation sometimes so and somebody who looks like them who's drippy who has the fashion you know they want to emulate that, you know, they, they want to, they want to emulate that. Sure. Um, so definitely transitioning kind of to how I, we know that you are an amazing technical designer. We, I mean, it can be just seen from, from the conversation that you're having, but I know that you also have other passions that you like to dive into. And I know one of those particularly um, is cooking. How did you kind of, how did you stumble into that? And how did that kind of start? And how is that elevated during quarantine? Right. Um, so kind of full circle moment where I was talking about my family and my ethnicity, like my family cooks. And I know a lot of people say that their family cooks and it's good, but it's like, it's really good. Like, it's really, really good. Um, and it's I'll not it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not specific to the women. Like, yes, the women throw down, but the men throw down, too. Um, so, you know, I've been very spoiled to get roti and you know curry and oxtail and also like creole food from you know louisiana like gumbo and corn etouffee and chicken sauce pecan all these different amazing things and even the asian food like just so good um and but it's intimidating right like when i would come home I would ask like my parents or a grandparent like would you please make this special dish for me um and it would be so amazing you're like yo i can't i can't top this um and so honestly through covid um new york got really hit or hit pretty badly in covid um and because of that i couldn't go home and so i just started facetiming my grandmother's like hey can you teach me how to make this can you teach me and i think it started with like brown stew chicken i was like i really wanted some brown stew chicken and rice and peas and um I just, you know, called one of them up and they were like, well, let me see your pot. Well, let me see your pot. Let me see this. Let me see that. And I need to be very clear, like in Caribbean cooking, especially, and I think even just in like black and brown cooking, most people don't measure. Okay. It's a little <laughs> bit of this, a little bit of that. And it's taste, taste, taste. And let me see your pot. Right. So I'm like, can y'all please just tell me a measurement? Um, and so a lot of times I would, they would orally kind of talk to me and I would just transcribe it down in my notebook so that I could cross-reference later. And then um, from there, you know, all it takes is one time succeeding, right? And that perpetuated me to say, oh, well, you know what? Let me make some kalu. Ooh, let me make some curry shrimp and roti from scratch. Ooh, let me make some oxtail. Like, and then it was just like, let me try and make like some homemade pasta. And once I started to kind of like master my own cultural foods, it gave me, um, it kind of gave me the willpower, the strength, whatever you want to call it, to then try other cultural foods. And so from there, I mean, Josh, you know me, like if I find something, like I'm into like researching. So if I find something that I think is dope, I'm going to share it with everybody. Um, and I was like, let me just put on a cooking class for like my family, right? And my close friends. It was a total, like Josh came to it. It was like, let me just see. And we had about like, like, like 20 people total. Yeah, almost like 20, 30. Yeah. And I was like, you know, can you guys give me feedback? Like what's working, what's not working? And then like I told everybody, just post it on IG, right? And mad people hit me up and were like, yo, how did I miss this? Like you're cooking? Like what's going on? Like all these different things. So I'm like, okay, let me actually like reach in and tap into my network and see who's going to show up. And what was really dope is like a lot of people have been showing up. Um, and at the time when I first launched it to the public, 
Um, it was during Pride Month. It was during like, you know, Juneteenth. And I was like, cool, all the proceeds are going to black and brown, you know, LGBTQ organizations. Like, this is how I'm going to find my way of impacting my community. Um, and so just each month, I would just kind of cater it to a different um, organization of my choosing. Um, and then also, from there, I kind of got into like, people wanted to buy my ice cream because I started making ice cream. So it was just like all of this stuff just started happening. And I'll be honest with you, prior to COVID, I was just in a very, like, I was in a slump creatively. I almost couldn't even like, the person that I was prior to right now wouldn't probably have admitted to you that I'm a creative person. And so this was an actual, very cathartic, very, um, it was just really important for me to find an outlet to release creatively. Because one of the things too, is when you are in a creative corporate environment, that can, that can completely bleed you dry. Um, and my soul was just, it was tired. And this has been an opportunity for me to kind of just like release and be fun and play and try new things um, and connect with other people and do a lot of storytelling as it pertains to my culture and just the foods that I'm even trying because, you know, I do reach out and do extensive research before I do, you know, let's say like an Italian dish, you know, just to make sure I'm honoring um, the other cultures that I'm deciding to, you know, cook from. So that's kind of how that evolved. And now it's kind of crazy. Uh, some things I've like pulled back. I'm like, y'all, I'm, I'm tired. I actually work like for a living. <laughs> like I can't just cook all the time, but it's been a lot of fun. So, and also being technical, it's an opportunity for me to use my hands when right now my role has kind of had to pivot because I can't go into the office to fit on someone. So I can touch the food, I can touch, um, you know, the pan, the spatula, I can figure out what I'm doing, I can mold and knead dough. And so that's been very satisfying to me as well. So you're all virtual at your like day job now at this point? Mm -hmm. Since March, yeah. Wow, that's crazy. It's crazy that you like discovered a whole new passion during quarantine. Like you actually were able to do what you had to say, like, you better learn a new skill or do something <laughs> new, have a side hustle. And it kind of just came out of just a like, hey, I want home, I want my family's cooking, but I can't mm -hmm. be, you know? Um, oh, that's crazy. So a show. Yes. Uh, what are we talking about when we say show? Are we talking like YouTube? Are we talking another distribution? <laughs> I mean, I'm open. So one of the things too was like, I am, I originally was all about travel, right? So I had an epiphany a couple years back that I hadn't taken any vacation. And I decided like, yo, I'm taking a vacation every single month. I don't care if it's domestic. I don't care if it's, you know, the, you know, international or mix of both. If it's just going to another city for, you know, a weekend vacation. There were no limitations, but I needed to rest and I needed a change of scenery. And so um, I'm really disciplined and calculated. So I made sure to kind of set that tone for myself. And I pretty much was able to get about 10 trips in 12 months. Um, and it was amazing. Like I was, I mean, Josh, you know, and I was just like, so that's kind of how my social media kind of um, was created with Dom Voyage. And then from there, I would I eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would eat. right there. <laughs> you know, you're right. Thank you. Um, I probably should trademark it. Um, but yes, every time get your domain <laughs> name, sis, get it all. Yes. I know, I know. I'm working on it. After this, we will have to talk about how I can really uh, kind of vet that through and make it happen. But I'd eat all the time, and I'd photograph it, and I would just do a lot of storytelling around who was the owner, like, um, what's the price point. Um, you know, what's the pro tip around coming here? So like a pro tip might be getting a bunch of small appetizers if you're trying to be on a budget. And then, you know, but you could go to this other fancy place right next door and get a cocktail and dessert. And that's how you could kind of have a true experience um, overall while you're here in this, in this particular city. Because eating is expensive. Eating well is even more expensive depending on the city that you're in. Um, and people were already coming to me for that. Like I eat out or I was eating out a lot. Um, and so because of that, that was just another way that I could add that to my, um, to my Instagram. So like I have this whole thing like Dom Appetit and I talked about the D's list and all these different things about like all the places that I eat out or I go or I experience while on a vacation. Well, then COVID hit. <laughs> um, 
So while I do still support a lot of local uh, restaurants and places to eat, um, obviously it's a little tricky right now during this time. So um, I was like, cool, I'm going to not only like most food bloggers, like they like to eat out, but they might not always like to cook. I was like, oh, pile it on, we gonna cook too. Um, and I wanted more than anything to um, empower my community, empower people that look like me to feel like they can cook for themselves. Yeah. Um, a lot of us live in food deserts. A lot of us don't have access to a Whole Foods or can afford to go to Whole Foods or, you know, mom's organic market, but you don't necessarily have to do that all the time. Maybe, you know, you still go to Walmart to get the most of your, the bulk of your groceries, but you can buy some of your produce organically um, or just, you know, changing little things like juicing or just taking care of yourself the best way that you can for your budget. Um, and so that's really why I started, you know, doing all the cooking because I just felt like we're all in the house, but you can still treat yourself well and you can still do all these things for yourself if you're willing to. And I feel like I did it in a way that was easy to um, understand, didn't feel too intimidating, at least from what people tell me. Um, so that's kind of how that came about too. So the show, people keep calling my cooking class the show, which is funny. But <laughs> I'm like, okay, if we they go. gotta watch it, then it's a show. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but like one day I was talking to friends over probably like FaceTime and I was like, I want to be the next Anthony Bourdain. Like I want to be the, the Listen, black. Listen, no, as you Bourdain. were talking and you're like, you know, down voyage and you're talking about I'm going out, eating out, showing where I'm like, mm, this is parts unknown. This is, I'm like, cause, you know, mm -hmm. like Wilo put me on an Anthony Bourdain and it's like all his shows and I'm like, this is, I'm like, she needs a travel show. Yeah, that's literally what I want. Like in, in a, in a, I don't want to say in a future world because I want to manifest phase this. Phase two but, of life, right? Right, phase two. I just want to have my own travel show that really exposes the local part of these communities. I think it's very easy to go to a place and have this very, you know, expensive or touristy experience, but there's a lot of amazing local places, especially in the Caribbean, like the best food you're gonna have in the Caribbean is at somebody's house. It's not gonna be at a restaurant. So like, how can you even have that experience? You know, like like in Trinidad, my aunt, she has like a, a store in the back, like a shop in the back of her house and people will go to her house and get cooked food as they would call it. Like you wouldn't get that at a restaurant. Um, so, how would you even know that? And that's driving business and revenue to these smaller businesses. It's con it's keeping the authenticity of these communities intact, you know, without having to, you know, get bought out or displaced. Um, and so I really want to highlight and tell those stories. Um, I don't exactly know how I'm going to do that yet, but I would. I that's the vision. So she's got some producer help. You know, we we connected her with some <laughs> yes. people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, Marcus Samuelson, a chef, he has his show, No Passport Required, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a, that's a whole show, because also those were two, they're two chefs, and they're older, right? And you're coming from a totally different discipline, who's discovered a love of home cooking, and you're like, okay, but I also travel, which that travel part answered a big question I had. I said, oh, the coin is good at Under Armour. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing like you can travel on a budget too and i tell people oh, that sure. like i'm all about um you know traveling on a budget if i need to like stay at a friend's house or i mean i'm very big on like having your own space that's super important but yeah I, no no comment on the salary but you know we're eating we're eating well over here <laughs> I know it. I know it. <laughs> you better say that salary good. You'd be like, I'm trying to get young people to come in a technical design. You'd be like, the salary, the money, and all that. They'd be like, Yeah, we're oh. still aspiring for more. You know, you know how it goes. Oh, oh yeah, huh? Yeah. <laughs> You'd be like, hold up, I'm doing all the work, but no, it, Under Armour's good. We won't do that. Yeah, um, <laughs> and I must say, like during this time too, like I've been very proud of um, how we have like really stepped up our game with diversity and inclusion and equity team and just like really having hard conversations like that. I don't, I can't speak for any other organization, but we're, we're doing the work and the work is really messy and hard, but it's good. It's necessary. Yeah. So hopefully that is a step in the right direction, you know, for future generations. Yeah. That's, and like you said, people, kids thinking about, oh, or 
you know, 10, 12, 15, 20 years ago saying, I'm going to school for design, it was always really specific. It better be like architecture mm -hmm. or something really, really specific. But people forget that our complete environments and cities and towns is all designed, you know, whether it's um, city planning, just like the tables, even, I mean, and I'm a design junkie. So that's why I was like, oh, this is going to be a good conversation. Because I, I mean, I get, I get irked over little stuff. Like my, my like son, before I had to teach him, like, this is the dish drying rack. It has these lines so the plates can stand up. Right. It, it, it makes sense, you know, but it's like, there are so many brilliant people who have so much technical experience to design something like when it's not designed well, we've noticed, right? Exactly. exactly. But when it's done right and um, it is done really well, sometimes we don't notice because it's so easy. It's an ease to it. But it's like, there's a lot of brilliant people who make these decisions and why not be people like us? Correct. Especially where in fashion and sports, we kind of dominate as far as in setting the culture of like what is cool looking and sometimes how it's used, you know? It's so true. In certain disciplines, my role and the designer's role actually be com combined. So it's even like when you start talking about industrial designers, like, and even architecture, architectural designers, like they're designing and problem solving through. Like a great design has been vetted through countless times in order so that like when it is actually being mass produced or produced for the final time, it's, it is seamless. Um, and to your point, you have mentioned like somebody that would do wear testing. We have somebody who product test is a wear tester. And so after I've made a garment, they will go out into the field and put it on a team or put it on one of our athletes and they will wear test it and give us feedback. And we'll be able to figure out how to pivot if something is not working, um, if there's like bleeding or like, I don't want to throw too many words um, that could be a little too technical, but essentially any type of bleeding, color transfer, um, shrinkage, when you wash it and launder it, like all of that stuff goes into the development process, which is why the development process takes so long. It takes about 14 to 18 months um, just to get a product to the consumer. You know, so that's why um, when you start to go and incorporate more tech and like the whole virtual prototyping, that's huge because you're you always want to cut down the time it takes to get it to the customer. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's a there's tons of roles, and I think that we just need to start talking about them and highlighting them so that there's just more opportunity for more people of diverse background and experiences to you know have those roles. That's wow. Mm -hmm. Josh is speechless. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> this is it's cool. It's crazy because like I'm like knowing uh, Don for so long, and you just you. I hear these things constantly, but having her have the time to sit down and kind of articulate all, all these things and like what it took to get to where she's at is always, it's always impressive. You know what I mean? Like you see your friends striving and doing great things, but like having them sit down and describe them like, wow, like you really, like you really did that. And like, you really do these things. And it's like, when you imagine somebody, like they always say like, become the person you want that you imagined yourself being or you, what you wanted to see that didn't exist. It's like you're doing that, you know what I mean? There wasn't necessarily anybody in your position or even excelling in the way that you are. And you know, and you created that, you became that. And now you have the ability to now be visible and say, hey, you guys can do it too. You just need to do X, Y, and Z. You know yeah. what I mean? And I'm sure there's tons of people like me or some sprinkled in throughout different organizations. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of finding them. You know, I don't want us to all be unicorns, right? Like we are amazing and beautiful and magical, but I want more of that magic to be seen um, and celebrated uh, throughout this industry and throughout all industries, to be honest. Um, so, yeah. It makes sense. And so many people in fashion now, like whether it's like boutiques and like designing like their boutique labels and stuff, but those are all real world problems, like color bleed and stuff. I've had times where I'm like, what is this on my couch? And then you realize it's that new garment you bought. And yeah. you're like, it's not color fast, right? And it's yep. the color fatness, fastness didn't pass or like, you know, something was garment dyed and they didn't, and it sheds. There's a certain amount of shedding that happens. Um, certain colors are just going to, you know, like indigo blue. Girl, you better wash that about 500 times, you know, or just understand it's going to bleed um, because it's expensive. 
And that's the other thing, like when my friends do come to me about this, I am very tough. I mean, Josh knows I'm very tough and it's because I just don't want you to go into a situation without the tools and the proper education and just bleed your money. See, because, what, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, it, you know, people think, oh, well, if I only want to make about 50 units, no, supply and demand, right? What's the cost of supply and demand? If you're only doing about 50 units, factory don't want to do 50 units. They want to do, I mean, sometimes one of my styles could be 100,000 units. So yeah, that's why it's super cheap to make something because the amount of business they're getting from this particular place is, you know, a lot more. So if they have to do a small order run, that's time to set up the machines, to sew your garment, that's taking away from bigger business. Unfortunately, there are smaller places that do small runs, like small run factories, there's some in Philly even, that are super dope. Um, but it's important to educate yourself before you jump in, because you know, a lot of amazing, talented designers have lost everything behind trying to get their products out there. And I just would hate for somebody I know to be in that predicament, like when there's a wealth of knowledge that I could pass on to you or point you into the direction of somebody else. Like, I don't know everything, but one of my biggest talents is to, is that I can point you to somebody else who does, right? Um, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. You just need to have access to that person. Um, mm. So it's super important. Yeah. So what's so next, no, so oh. the next time you go shopping, Amir, we got to bring you with us because Dom is my boutique shopping buddy. Whenever I go anywhere, I'm always like, listen, check out this spot, pull up to this spot. She's a, uh, that we were just talking about the Ivy Park drop yesterday. You were sitting here geeking, oh, yeah. geeking out over a cart. So <laughs> next time we even get heavily involved in that stuff, I'll make sure I hit you up. Yeah. And I love the obscure brands too. Like I love, I believe that nowadays, like there should be a nice range of mixing. You might want to have like a really great core piece that is expensive. That's just going to season after season, you know, show up and be a, a, and stand out in your closet um, and elevate your wardrobe. And then maybe there are some other things that can be, you know, not as expensive, but as, you know, climate change does become bigger and bigger, I do feel like it's my duty to buy more into slower fashion and less into fast fashion because yeah. that enters the landfill a lot quicker. Um, quicker. Yeah. Trying to connect friends to not throw away clothing and donate it. Even that is one of those things where I'm like, come on. But it's also like, how much how much stuff do you need you know what i mean sometimes mm -hmm. it's individuals and i know it's counter um and like or i should say counter productive or like fiscally counterproductive for a company like under armor to even like set a message like that of like you don't need more stuff because you want to sell stuff but it, it is kind of like how much stuff at what cost right yeah um, and i think too it's like a lot of these companies are setting up opportunities to have more green incentives so whether that's you know using a ton of recycled water bottles to now put into the you know fabrics that they're producing and making their clothing with or just using less water to make your stuff right but it's tough like i think that's a dilemma and a challenge that every company that's producing a good um deals with on a daily basis because like yes you want to make this thing but this thing also requires a lot of natural resources and what are the implications on our environment right now because we really cannot afford to take, turn a blind eye now that the consumer is starting to educate themselves more and um you know the consumer has all the power so if all of a sudden the consumer is like i just want all i want are grapes i don't know like you better be sure the grapes are going to be trending or the cut like all of that goes into it people you know there's tons of research that people do on just consumer insights alone that's a role where people study people and their consumers and their habits and then you want to tap into that you want to tap into it as authentically as you can but like that's a thing um whether it's a tech company or products goods company so you know it's just it's, it's definitely tough especially for myself as i even educate myself more on these impacts on our environment so yeah i want to circle back to one thing you said you said before you wouldn't have considered yourself a creative mm -hmm. or you wouldn't, wouldn't have described yourself as that right. was that like something where you felt like i am interpreting someone else's design versus designing myself um 
or was that a thing of like kind of sometimes all creatives get imposter syndrome? I think it was the latter because I understood like the role and I and what I signed up for. Like when I first got here, I just was like, I got a job opportunity and I I don't know. Like I'm one of those type of people like if I don't know, I I want to try it. There's certain things inherently I'm like I'm cool. Like I don't need to do drugs to know that that's not good for me. You know what I mean? Like I'm cool. But as it pertains to like trying something new and an experience, I'm all about it. Um, but I got imposter sh- syndrome and I really just was burnt out. And I have a huge group of friends that are all creative within the industry too. So you can't help but be like, oh, so-and-so is doing this dope thing over here and so-and-so is there and you're competitive. I'm very silently competitive, but I am competitive and I like want to outdo myself each time. So I'm like, yo, Dom, like you're not producing anything of your own work like yes you're doing a good job at work but like what are you doing that's edifying your soul right like I stopped asking people how they're doing I started asking like how's your soul because that's a question that I don't think people take enough time to actually um reflect on and that's something that like my soul was dehydrated and creatively it was just completely um you know I don't want to say barren but it was just famished I was famished and I didn't really know. And I was going through some other things personally too, but like I really was affected by that. And so it wasn't just like, oh, I'm doing somebody else's um, designs because it's a partnership, like everything from color to, you know, supply chain, all design. It's it's a huge set of, um, it's a huge engine that's like working to get this yeah. stuff done. But it was just like, Maybe I'm a fake because I come home and like, I don't, I don't draw anymore. I don't, you know, sew anymore. I'm not making things. Um, Maybe I'm like a phony in some sort of way. And really it was just like, that's not the only way you can be creative. Yeah. Um, And it took me a long time, lots of conversations with my friends telling me, girl, you creative, what you talking about? And I'm like, I'm not. And and having to change that negative self-talk is very self-deprecating. I'm really hard on myself and very critical of myself. So I had to kind of shift and just say, no pressure, Dom. Like, just, just try something and let it evolve. Do you, do you, are you a Sex in the City fan? Oh, got the whole box there, girl. <laughs> yeah. So every time I think of like creativity and like that feeling of being like, ah, like what, I always think of the Russian. Mm. and him with his light installation and he was like what if they just look at me and see I'm the stupid old man with the lights mm-hmm. you know and it's just yeah. I feel like every creative has that point where you're just like am I fake am I seeing am I seeing something that it won't even translate not even that no one else could see like what am I doing right. I, I watched Masterclass with um Frank Gary and he was talking about like the daunting blank canvas mm-hmm. of like when you're just starting to make something and you're just sitting there like well what you know Cause it's like, even with like graphic design, I get that where I'm like, what am I doing? This is dumb. And it's not being yeah. classically trained. You'll be like, it's already going to see through me that I'm just right. somebody who just learned how to use Photoshop. But and then know, when it's done, I'm the like, best. that's the <laughs> best. I'm done. You, you're not pigeonholed to like, exactly the formal training. But cause at the end, you can't tell me nothing. I'd be like, well, mm-hmm. never doubt me. Are they and crazy? I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> sure yeah, but in the, beginning, in the beginning, you just be like, I'm, am I even doing anything? And that's right. the next part. That is weird when you're around a creative community. And I guess Josh probably can relate to that in film sometimes where people are talking about their newest projects and you're just like, uh, I, I've been, uh, well, you know, you just get a little, you feel, um, it's, it's like an insecurity for sure, yeah. you know, but you're it just, really is. Yeah. and I think too, like our culture is that of like if you're not producing and it's not perfect and it's not continuously yeah. happening then like what are you right yeah. um and so um I think in writing it's like or when you're in like psychology or whatever it's like publish or perish like I think people think that like if you're not producing you're going to perish and so um a lot of times I would get so caught up on I need it to be so perfect before I drop it that I just wouldn't even drop it uh like at all I wouldn't I have all these things I want to do and I and I would just wouldn't and so it was like where do you even start and so one of the things I thought of was like Micah has these drawing classes that you can take and you don't have to actually attend the the university and it was like 
um, I want to say it was like $200 for the semester. And it was just like a figure drawing class. And yeah. you come in and you get to come into the studio and for three hours on like a Tuesday night, I would go and draw. And I remember it was, it like started in August, went until, you know, December. And I told my friends, I was like, yo, I can't do anything on Tuesdays. I, I will be going to class from six to nine. And even some days I would draw and something great would come. Some days I would draw and maybe not, but it was a safe space to just say, there's no grade. Nobody has to look at this. I'm just going to start training your hand. You know, you're, it's all about your hand-eye coordination, right? That's why there's a lot of art, like artists and like athletes because their hand-eye coordination, their hand-foot coordination, all that you're seeing and then you're doing. Um, and that started to kind of like give me some validation, like, oh shoot, like I really do still have this, you know? And then from there, just like quietly trying to figure out what else I wanted to kind of dabble in and get into because it is very daunting, but you, I guess it's like, you just have to kind of, for me, I would just like tentatively plan things out. Um, I can be very type A and structured. So I make a list for everything. Um, it's kind of how I stay on task. And um, that just kind of like, what are the things that you want to do that can kind of get you back to where you've kind of like veered off. And that was kind of all of those things I think have helped validate me to even get to cooking right, or to get to sharing that cooking, because it's like one thing to cook is another thing to then capture it and then take um, pictures and share it with other people, you know, so they could judge it, like, what, what is that? They know they will, <laughs> the internet be crazy, they be like, oh, I've seen better, you be like, hey. Just, yeah, like you know, started. yeah, you, you, like, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, so with you saying you're very type A and you're like very structured, do you have like a morning routine? Cause like you're, you sound like it's extremely productive, you know? So <laughs> I have a lot of energy. <laughs> um, I want to say the type of energy I have, but I won't say that cause I'm trying to be professional. I'll tell you af after this is over, but essentially um, I would say like my most structured days are probably Tuesdays and Thursdays, but my tentative morning routine is like, I get up, I read my Bible app, and I put on clothes and I go work out with my trainer at 8 a.m. After I come back from working out with my trainer, I'll, you know, get dressed, shower, get dressed. Um, I'll make a juice. So any kind of juice that I, you know, Josh, I'm all into this juicing. Um, it really was sets the tone for my morning routine is like, I feel like my brain just never shuts off even when I'm sleeping. So that like sleep between, I don't know, six to 7 a.m. Cause I can't sleep past 7 a.m is when it's like, it's like my brain's waking up and it's telling me all these things that I need to be doing. So I remember like sleeping and my spirit was like, you need to buy a juicer and you need to start like getting more vegetables into your diet and like research a juicer. So I woke up and after I did that, I started researching all this stuff about juicing, right? Long story short about the juicer, started juicing. So that's a part of my morning routine. And then from there, like I think my best and I, I think like I just have the most juice in the morning. So like I keep my notebook and I just, I write, write it down. Like you're most prophetic, like when you wake up and you just, it's in there. Or I mean, for some people it's at night, but for me it's in the morning. Um, and then from there, I kind of give myself a personal list and a work list. And I had to kind of really um, force myself like hard stop no later than seven, the latest um, for like work stuff. If five is the ideal time. And then from there, it's play. It's like curating your menu for the week. So what are we eating? Being intentional about what you want to do, you know, going and cooking. And sometimes cooking is late. <laughs> like it'd be 10 o'clock at night and I've gotten this idea to try and make something. And I'm like, oh, and I have to record it. And I have to like, you know, I want to post it. And not everything, you know, gets made. But essentially, that's kind of how I structure my days. Um, and then if there's any kind of calls or phone conversations or anything like that, that's usually after five. That's kind of like my hard rule, just so I can be present. Um, I, it's so funny, like, as it pertains to friends, families, actually, like, you know, just other things. I just want to be super present, present at work, present in my personal life, present, you know, with a friend, because it's just so easy to be on your phone or just be trying to do too many things at once and you're not doing them well. 
And so because my brain can just be going, like, I think there's this meme where it's like, like 17 uh, internet browsers that are open and one is like stalling out. Well, yeah, that's me sometimes. <laughs> um, so I ha like, I don't, I wasn't type A by nature. I feel like I kind of trained myself um, because it was like, yo, I don't want to be caught slipping. And if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. You know what I mean? So sometimes the energy is just like, how are we channeling this energy? How are we being mindful and intentional of the energy? Um, but definitely a juice, working out, a little bit of prayer, meditation, like that's part of the routine, definitely in the morning. And then, you know, start the day. I gotta get my life together. That's what, that's what you're telling me. Cause I'm like, cause okay, so what's your typical bedtime? Cause see, for me, it's- <laughs> Are you a night owl? I, I kind of am, but then I let that's things- okay. will things will slide me into being a night owl because I'll be up doing something just too late. And then I'm like, I'm a seven, eight hour sleeper, you know? Yeah, you and I don't, think, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Like most of my creative friends are night owls. Like I am a, a little bit of a, I guess, weirdo and I like the morning. But the but money I, is I just, in the morning though. Say money that again. The, the money is in the, the morning. The money is in the morning, you know? I, I, I do believe that. It's like... <laughs> I think there was a report that like most CEOs wake up between the hours of like four and five a.m. every day, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you get the news, you get to see what's going on. I think one of the things that I love about the morning is the stillness. Yes. It's the calm. It's Maybe. it's the sun coming up. It's the setting the intention for my day. Like, I might some days I wake up and I'm not feeling it, and I'm like, cool, we're gonna go work out, and we're gonna shake that energy off. And then it's like, cool, let, let's bring it back. Like always trying to find center, bringing back to center. Um, and we're not perfect. Like I'm telling you my highlight reel right now. There's so many times where I'm just like, ooh, am I going to go get on that Peloton bike? I don't think so. Like I'm tired, you know? And Josh will hit me up. I'm like, he's like, yo, did you work out? Like go work out. And I'm like, okay. okay. So for me, I try to stack as many things that I don't want to do in the morning. Like get it out of the way. Because by the time... By the time the evening comes, that's my re that's like the time I take to relax or to yeah. tinker or to just get into random things and like not be pigeonholed to a, a schedule. And you know, when I go on vacation, no schedule, like mm -hmm. none. There's only things that I want to hit. I don't want to be a part of the schedule. I don't want to get on the plane and get there, like because it's just really um, it's really hard to just always be like wound up like that. It, it's yeah. not fun. Yeah. Um, so sometimes you just gotta let your hair down and just relax. And so I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's great. And most creatives do work late at night because there's a stillness at night too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But the, the discipline is the key. So yes. it's like, you're just creative to be creative. That's fine. But if you want to monetize and build business around the creativity, it's usually you need a routine and a discipline. Yeah, it is true. Um, and sometimes it's hard because you'll be tired right most of us are working normal like other jobs and then to have to pour into your passion it, you know you have to just find it within yourself but that's where the discipline comes um and you asked me what time i go to bed um it varies so <laughs> sometimes i could just be <laughs> up like i told you like sometimes you oh, make brownies at like 1 a.m you know and just like filming it and getting it right and doing all these different things but um no, sleep deprivation is real and I am affected by lack of sleep the second night so or the second day so I typically try to go to bed no later like somewhere between 11 and 12 okay because my eyes will just be so like my body I'm gonna look at a computer screen it's just not it personally yeah. I gotta get regimented <laughs> <laughs> you just gotta make a little list yeah, yeah like, like literally, I, I have my notebook with me all the time, like all the time. And whatever, whatever requires you to get excited about writing it down or just looking at it, because that's what it is. So, yeah. like in my bathroom, I have tons of post its of like, um, what do they call those? Like affirmations. Yeah. Or just things that I want to get done, because like seeing it holds you accountable. So, yeah. I have that. Huh. So even, I would say so even even with that um 
Jessica, I know we are, I know we're pushing it our, our time a little bit, but I wanna I wanna ask you two more things to make sure like okay. we have a, a, a complete understanding. So I think one of the things that we always ask is just like what really who or what really inspires you or kind of keeps you keeps you going, whether it's like your creative juices, you as a person, a human being, like who or what really is or like my creative you. juices or someone whose career you might like you look at and you're like, I'm chasing it. Like, you know. Yeah. So as a person, like just, I think like just the story of my family being immigrants, but as, like in particular, like my mom, like just was grinding, like didn't go to school the traditional way, you know, but was working on Wall Street through a cooperative a program at 16 and like moved out and was just, just out here doing it. Like, I, I feel like that's something that was very admirable. So I'm always chasing that level of success that she had um and i think that's just very important seeing a woman figure like i have a lot of female figures in my in my family that were just like out here doing it in their own field whatever that looked like so that's really what kind of um just quenches my spirit and gives me the motivation to continue to grind when i'm when sometimes i'm like i don't know if this is for me or i don't know if i can do it as it pertains to like designers or just creatives um you know inspirations oh there's so many one that i love because he's like his stuff is just kind of like a little eerie and quirky i love tom brown um he has a lot of fun like he's pl constantly playing with like you know the real world and fantasy and like just looking at how he'll take something like alice in wonderland and flip it on its head or just playing with gender um so like you're seeing a lot of dope men in kilts and skirts and things like that and blazers and tailored pieces and so um and very new york still you know and i just i do love that um you're putting me on the spot in terms of other designers um oh man there's this one young lady i don't want to butcher her name she's based in brooklyn i think her name is Adele Jean-Pierre, she went to SCAD, um, maybe a couple years older than me, but like she's she's outfitted like Michelle Obama, she's outfitted salon, she has a really dope um, small boutique and just really great custom pieces. I like things that are really structured. Mm -hmm. um, so I like obscure brands um, as well. So like, you know, when I was telling you the other day, like I bought this like Acme Studios jacket and it was expensive, but it was like, you know, this is like butter, lamb skin, leather. Like it's gonna, it's going to just be dope time, season after season. There's a lot of Asian brands that are just doing it out here and really doing, playing with shape. Um, and like, you know, cause everything doesn't have to be skin tight. You can wear a really great structural piece that plays with line and curve um, and, and silhouette. And like that stuff is really dope. Um, so I really love that. I also love like a lot of just like people who are taking things and kind of like reconstructing them. Um, I think that's fun. And so just, I mean, everybody black that's doing it. <laughs> Peter Moss, like I love what Kirby's what doing. Um, yeah. You know, he's out here really changing the narrative and just being authentically himself. Um, and I think that's really, really important. Um, and so you know, shout out to him and what he's doing. There's just, there's just so many. And I probably after this will be like, oh, I should have said this person, this person, this person. But, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot of um, amazing talent out there at all ages. Like there's some young kids doing some amazing things. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I think that, you know, that's, that's what's so inspiring, but definitely black women, definitely, uh, as cliche as it might say, but my mom and some of the other women in my life, um, they they really do edify me on a consistent basis that help me to keep going, sure. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I mean, just knowing the relationship that you have with your mom, she definitely is a heartbeat for you and a, and a, and a feel for that. I think um, that transitions to the last question that we have, which is always, um, we always like to ask our, um, disruptors who come on the show but like what does it mean to be a disruptor to you and whether that's in your field in your life what do you what do you consider uh, being a disruptor 
So the funny thing is, I don't consider myself a disruptor. So that's we exactly consider you a disruptor. <laughs> <laughs> um, what does it mean to be a disruptor? Um, like honestly, just consistency. Consistency, consistently showing up, or consistently being disciplined enough to show up in your authentic self, um, not apologizing for it and and doing the work and like pouring in and sometimes like pouring into something else or to someone else when it doesn't even necessarily benefit you directly there's a lot of people out here doing things to disrupt the culture to be seen right like what about all the people that are just out here doing the work day in and day out and you don't even know they're doing that or being a contributor i think like being a disruptor is being a contributor to the culture um, not really worrying what the, um, what the reward is going to be, but just knowing, like, I have to do this. Like, I have a calling. I believe, like, people who are true disruptors have a calling on their life to, to, to do this thing, whatever that thing is. Um, and so, you know, and they're consistent about it. It's not, I just did it today and mm, cool on to the next thing. No, like, you see the people who've made the biggest, um, influence or disruption have consistently time after time showed up have done it did not apologize for it and did it even when it wasn't cool to do it there's a lot of people right now caping for certain people and it was not cool you know there was a sacrifice that uh kaepernick had to make for a minute for <laughs> like you know what i'm saying before it was even honored it was even acknowledged and i think that that's what a disruptor does. It's you're not doing the cool thing. You're doing the right thing. Yeah. Um, and it also means like dying to self in order for this thing to happen. I think mm -hmm. that like there's a level of like, because it isn't cool, like I had to die to like do like what myself is saying. Cause my myself or my spirit or my flesh might be being like, don't do that. You got to mess up your coin. Why are you trying to help these little kids? Like that's gonna be a lot of work and time and energy and effort, but you know, that's going to help pass the baton to the next person, you know, and so that's why you do that type of work. That's what a disruptor does, in my opinion. So. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah, speaking of consistency is very much like, I think, a staple and a, a unified theme that I think we continue to continue to continue to discover when it comes to a lot of people that we, we get a chance to talk to. And um, I just want to personally thank you for coming on the podcast and no you know it's an honor. blessing us with your presence yeah not you are we're fantastic and um i think this is not only going to inspire other creators but i think it's going to inspire um many of the people that you hope to touch when it comes to <laughs> inspiring <laughs> for sure yeah, yeah no like I, it's i just thought you were always so unique in your position so i think it's really dope to um, have a chance to kind of talk, speak for yourself and talk about what that really entails so thank yeah. you thank you thank you much thank appreciated you. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. It was a huge honor. I really appreciate it. Cool. Um, I don't really know what our ending drop is anymore for season two, but uh, no, I'm, it's <laughs> like we're you're the, we're all <laughs> yeah, we're like in transition. So um, but I'm gonna just end it here and we can add it after. But okay. um. <laughs>